go forward with my presentation, the title of which is ECMO Usage Will Continue to Rise. So I want you to take a look at this picture. And wh what do you see? Well, you see some police. You see this SAMU, which just happens to be an EMS service. Um, you see a train. Um, so I'm assuming they're in a train station. Uh, this girl over here has a rather peculiar look to her. She's sort of smiling. She's wearing gloves. I can't tell if the smile is is humorous or if it's just from exhaustion. It's kind of hard or stress. It's hard for me to tell, but it's kind of an interesting picture because there's a lot of activity going on in this area here. Kind of give you a little bit better flavor of what's going on here. This looks like an art gallery. It happens to be the Louvre uh, in Paris. And if you look here, you can see that there's some really nice paintings. Um, in addition to that, you see over here uh, in this uh, image, a person holding a big bag of fluid. Uh, you look over here and you see this guy on the left holding a light. Uh, you see these two fellas here, which sort of look like they're getting ready for their photo opportunity for the calendar photo shoot. Um, and then you've got this happening over here. And look, this, this, this is pretty serious now. We've got people wearing surgical attire, they're wearing gloves, I'm assuming they're sterile. They're wearing surgical hats and masks. This fellow's here is kind of falling down, but there's a lot of surgery happening right here. Now remember, we're at the Louvre. And then this guy looks like he's praying. <laughs> now here's another picture. Here we see this area, that's what I want you to focus on, and again, that looks like there's a lot, there's surgery happening right here. This is very interesting. This fella here, I couldn't help but point him out. Uh, the light's here and I can see it. It looks a little bit dark here, but he seems to be looking the wrong way. But he's also holding up this barricade here, and one over here as well. So I guess they must also have HIPAA in, 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 in Paris. And then here's another interesting picture. Take a look at this. Look at this area right here. This, I want you to focus on this, but then I want you to really focus down here. For all of us that are perfusionists, what does that look like? That looks like a circuit tubing yeah. set to me. Mm -hmm. yeah, that looks set. like an ECMO circuit tubing set. And then there's this fellow over here that just wants to get to the Pringles, but apparently <laughs> can't get through. Well, that's exactly what it is. So this says the results from implementing on scene ECMO has shown a, and I'm trying to read that right there, an increase in survival from eight to 29% with acceptable neurologic uh, outcomes or status. So basically what you just got through seeing is patients being put on ECMO in a train station, in the Louvre, on a street, and in a grocery store. That is amazing that that is what they're doing. Their EMS service has physicians trained in cannulation and in operation of an ECMO circuit to put those patients on bypass. You know, you talk, you look at war, and in war, there's a golden hour, hour for a soldier. If a soldier gets wounded or injured, then they have, they say if you can get them to the, 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 the hospital or the field hospital or what, whatever care they're gonna get within an hour, their chances of survival are much, much higher. This is what they believe. If the patient has refractory cardiogenic shock, put them on ECMO in the street and then bring them into the hospital. That's, that's pretty remarkable. University of Michigan here in the United States. I'm not a big fan. I'm a Michigan State guy. I understand that. <laughs> All right, and that's why you looked at me. But the Trojans didn't do well. The Spartans. And, hmm? Spartans. Oh, the Spartans, that's yeah. right. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Same thing. Oh, clearly. Um, but, they, but nevertheless, they are starting a pilot project to do the same thing. They haven't done it yet, but I do believe they plan on doing it. And I do believe they are going to do it. Mm -hmm. 
Indeed, in the United States, between the years of 2006 and 2011, ECMO usage increased by 433%. And I'm telling you, I don't know about all my, my esteemed panel, but I'm certainly seeing it. In addition to that, in this uh, 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 article from the seminars in thoracic and cardiovascular surgery, trends in US extracorporeal membrane oxygenated use, uh, use and outcomes from 2002 to 2012. Now, if you look at the center uh, line that looks fairly flat right there, that is the average mortality, which has stayed fairly consistent. And you'll see some narrative about that here in just a second. You look at the dashed line, and that's the yearly mortality. And then if you look at the green line in 2007, that's the utilization. That is a very, very steep curve. And it looks like post-cardiotomy, cardiogenic shock, and, uh, and uh, uh, acute respiratory failure are the three with post-cardiotomy clearly dominating in this particular uh, graph of this data. Uh, but I do think that you're going to see a little later on, the expected increase in growth is actually going to come from the acute respiratory failure. But you can look at that and see in 2007, you can see it bumping up. And if you look at the light blue, which is this right here, and you look at 2010 to 2011, that's where we saw that H1N1, and that's where that big right. spike occurred. And then it sort of trailed off from there. But I think we're going to see it go up again uh, in the, uh, when the data comes out moving forward from there. ECMO use has increased significantly starting primarily in 2007 with changing clinical indications but stable mortality rates. That's the narrative that I just talked about from that graph. This study demonstrates that recent ECMO use has increased significantly and with increasing increasingly varied clinical indications. Mortality has remained stable throughout the period of increased ECMO use. The results support further ECMO technology diffusion across the United States and mounting clinical interest to expand ECMO as a salvage platform in increasingly heterogeneous clinical environments. What does that mean? It means they are advocating, they are supportive of putting ECMO patients on ECMO in further and further out community settings and managing them there, transferring them perhaps, but managing them until they can get them transferred. That it's no longer, we just don't have ECMO capability. They're suggesting in that, well, that's what I read from it, that this should be far more ubiquitous than it currently is. This, was, this is very provocative, and this really got my attention. Unconventional volume outcome associations in adult extracorporeal membrane oxygenation in the United States from uh, University of Pennsylvania. If you look at the light gray, those are high volume, account, high volume ECMO uh, programs. That's 30 or greater in a year. The dark blue is medium between greater than six, but less than 30 in a year. And the low volume in the light blue is six or less per year. Now, intuitively, I know what I should expect from this, but this just really caught my attention. The mortality and the length of stay and the duration of the ECMO run was shorter in the lower volume uh, 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 programs than they were in the medium or the high. Completely the opposite of what I would have expected. Now, that could be selection, it could be the higher volume centers are taking patients maybe in more of the salvage category. I mean, there can be a lot of reasons. And the article, though a good article, really didn't clearly state what the reason for this was. So, you know, I, that's my hypothesis as a potential. 
But I think this is the reason why we are seeing so much more ECMO and why the outcomes with ECMO have improved over all these years. This is just one of many studies that are out there. I didn't want to just throw a whole bunch of studies on there. But predicting survival after, you know, extra post circulation in severe uh, uh, ARDS and uh, this is a survival prediction or RESP score. And basically, I think what we've gotten really good at is patient selection in time of initiation at predicting who is more likely to be a survivor. Um, now, I think as technology improves, and I think that's been a big player in this, survival's gotten better, not just based solely on this, but I think that one can't be without the other. So the technology got better, our protocols got better, our understanding of everything that's going on got better, how we select the patients got better, how we're managing them got better, the medications we're using got better, um, understand the cannulation is better, we have the Avalon cannula, we have the, the uh, what's that one, uh, not cardiac assist, but it's called the uh, uh, Tandem Life. The one that goes into the pulmonary artery and, and protect and duo tandem lung. That's it, and it and and it almost complete that one almost completely eliminates recirculation. Mm -hmm. Plus, I think our cannulas are smaller than in the old days. We don't we're not right. it's it's a lot better managing coagulation. But I think along with all these technological advancements, we've also gotten to a point of better understanding those patients who do have a chance versus those that have no chance. And that's the only patients that we used to put on ECMO. I think there is, uh, well, let me, let me show you this. This is one of these heart string, one of these, one of these heart string pullers. But this is another thing I think that plays Early a role February, in this. I had some swelling in my ankle. I didn't really think anything of it. It turns out it was an undiagnosed blood clot. I was at home with my husband. We were watching the Grammys early February, and all of a sudden I blacked out and I started having a seizure. We really had no idea what was happening because I'd been healthy. I was active, young 20 something, and then all of a sudden I was really sick. So thankfully my husband was my first hero, rushed and um, called 911, got an ambulance to come. And immediately um, my paramedics decided that they were gonna take me to Legacy Emanuel, which was the second hero of my night was taking me to Legacy Emanuel. That's when I stopped remembering anything. And apparently I got rushed to the emergency room and in the emergency room, my heart stopped four times. Thankfully, my emergency room doctor, Dr. Mike Stone, knew exactly what to do, gave me an ultrasound, and found out that the blood clot that had originated in my ankle had traveled up to my lungs and heart, and it became a pulmonary embolism. From there, they got me stable, and I was placed on ECMO right there in the emergency room. And from what I've been told, I am the first person in the West to be put on ECMO right there in the emergency room. So I'm very thankful for that. Now, we've put patients on ECMO here in the emergency room, uh, yeah. not infrequently, not, yeah. not too infrequently. Right. But again, it's, a, it's, it's very different that we are now suggesting that, that it's, 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 it's populating out, putting patients on ECMO in the ED. It's going to eventually populate out to the street. I think this is just going to be the evolution of what we see. So I, I just am convinced that, that, that we are going to uh, uh, see ECMO utilization continue to climb. Uh, and I, I think more significantly than people right now believe, but everybody is saying it's going to increase. It's to what degree and are we really prepared for it? And that's going to be kind of your guys' mm -hmm. sort of thing to discuss here moving forward. Now, the ER doc's name was Mike Stone. So Dr. Or Dr. Stone, that's right, Dr. Mike Stone. So he kept her from having a stone heart, but more importantly, uh, which was great on his part, but I watched the Grammys this year also, and I had a seizure, but I didn't have a pulmonary embolus. So there's also an economic component to this. In this uh, transparency market research, I highlighted what I wanted you to read. The uh, intelligence study has projected the demand in the global ECMO machine market in increment at a, as, at a notable 
uh, combined a annual growth rate, combined annual growth rate, that's what CAGR is, of 7.1% during the forecasted period of 2017 to 2022. So a 7.1% growth rate every year for that period of time would be incredible. Yeah. I don't think we're prepared for it. And again, based on modality, the uh, this market research report segments the global ECMO machine market into veno arterial ECMO, veno venous ECMO, and arterial venous ECMO, and detects, and this was very interesting to me, that veno, veno, ec, veno venous ECMO segment is currently <clears throat> the most profitable, <clears throat> providing for a demand share of 47.7% of all ECMO in 2017. There is an economic motivation for ECMO to increase, as well as all of the right. really important things that we, 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 we talk about in terms of saving patients' lives. Right. But we all know that if there's no money, it's not going to happen. Right. Right. And with that, I will say thank you very much for listening to my, for my presentation.